the day we celebrate how he did, how he saved us. And the title is, How Do I Thank Jesus for What He Did? So let us pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today that we can come before you and we can ask you to be with us, Lord, as we open your word. And Lord, we also want to thank you for people, great and brave people like Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, that did his best to, uh, through a peaceful means, to bring about change and reformation. Lord, uh, it's interesting, his name was Martin Luther because Martin Luther, uh, the original Martin Luther from the Reformation, uh, brought about a, uh, a earth-shaking and shattering and transformation. Uh, and, uh, was, and, and the world has never been the same since his day. And America has never been the same, and the world has been greatly influenced in a positive way by Martin Luther King Jr. So Lord, we, we pray for that movement, that uh, the peaceful movement to bring us all uh, to be one and that uh, we'll, we'll continue to uh, grow and to be, uh, and, and ultimately, Lord, because you have called us as brothers and sisters, as our eyes are on Jesus, we become one, one with you and one with each other. And Lord, in, in eternity, we will be one and uh, there will be no division among us. And we pray for that experience uh, in our own personal lives as we interact with people around us. We pray for that experience in our church families around the world that we, uh, we always recognize that in Christ we are, there's no male nor female, bond or free. Uh, we are all one in Christ. And we, we celebrate that oneness in Jesus. And may we keep our eyes on Christ and draw closer to you and closer to each other every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our eyes on the cross. When we re read in Luke chapter 23 and verse 23... We read, and when they had come to that place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And what, a, what an amazing thing. Uh, and, you know, as you think about this, you think, well, who crucified Jesus? And the reality is, we all crucified Jesus. Every single one of us. His, his sins, uh, our sins were laid upon him. He, we are all responsible for Christ's crucifixion. We may not have been obviously physically there, but he went to the cross because of the sins of the world. He went there voluntarily. He went there as his father, as the word in, in John uh, 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus was given to us and he, he, and he accepted that gift uh, of his willingness to give his life as a gift for all of us. And uh, it's an amazing thing. We read in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12 uh, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Christ suffered without the gate. For transgression the law of the law of God, Adam and Eve were banished from Eden and they had to leave Eden. Christ, our substitute, was uh, to suffer without the boundaries of Jerusalem, not in the city, but outside. He died outside the gate uh, where felons and murderers were executed. And I'm reading some scripture and I'm reading from uh, selections from a book, The Desire of Ages, which you can get on the outside, uh, chapter tw uh, 78, uh, called Calvary. And so he, uh, Christ, uh, died outside the gate where felons and murderers were executed. Full of significance are the words, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Jesus became the curse of the law. Galatians chapter 3.13. And then in 2 uh, second Corinthians 5 and verse 21, which uh, we're happy that Louise is back, and Louise always helps me to remember that verse, and now, Louise, after all your help, I remember it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Uh, that's a beautiful text, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Remember this, never forget this verse. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made 
the righteousness of God in him. Jesus exchanged. He took our sin and he became sin. He died because sin, the wages of sin is death. So he died that death. So that, but it says, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the, he gives, he takes our sin. He becomes sin for us. He dies because the wage of sin is death. But, he, but the gift of God, eternal life, is, and, uh, through, it is eternal life. And that is his, his righteousness. We receive his righteousness in exchange. He gives us, we give him our sin. He gives us his righteousness. There's no better transaction ever. There's no better deal. There's no better transaction. You couldn't do better than that. To take our misery and our pollution and our sin and our, all the misery of this world on himself and give us his life and his righteousness. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 says that I will put enmity. This was a promise when Adam and Eve sinned and fell. They, they, they God immediately put into the plan of salvation. This plan of salvation was designed to recover his broken uh, Adam and Eve. But not only that, he, the whole the whole earth was to be recovered by this promise. This is the first messianic promise, the promise of a Messiah who would come and give himself. And it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And so what this means, it says, it shall, it, that is the seed of the woman, who was who? The seed of the woman is Jesus. So <clears throat> it, the seed of the woman, Jesus shall bruise thy head. Whose head? Satan. Satan. So he would bruise his head. And thou, talking about the serpent, the devil, Satan, shall bruise his heel. So there's two bruises here. The bruise of the head. When your head is bruised, crushed, that's deadly. Ultimately, the devil's head will be crushed eternally. He's not going to be running hell. He's not going to have a pitchfork in his hand, poking people and pushing them into a fire so they'll writhe for eternity uh, in this fire, screaming. And That's not God's way. That's not how he deals with the problem of sin. The way he deals with the problem, that was designed to scare people into conforming to the dictates of particular religious thinking. And it was a misrepresentation of the character of God. And God's plan is not that plan. He said, those who believe on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We either, we, it's a life and death decision. Jesus wants us to choose life. He says, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So there's going to be two bruises. Uh, or two bruises are, are, are spoken of here. One is the bruise... Uh, of the head, Satan's head will be crushed and bruised forever. The Bible says that fire will come out from inside him and consume him. He will never exist again. He will be ashes under the feet of the righteous, along with the wicked will be ashes under the feet of the righteous as well. And it says, thou the serpent, the devil, Satan shall bruise his heel. The heel of the seed of the woman who is Jesus, his heel will be bruised. Is, is if, you, if your heel, heel was bruised or crushed, would that kill you? It would not, you would, it would not suffer death, eternal death. Satan suffers eternal death. Jesus suffered a horrible wound, but it wasn't fatal because there, on the third day, what happened? Jesus was resurrected. Jesus, Jesus, uh, God resurrected him. Jesus said, I can lay my life down and I can raise it up again in three days. So this was the promise in Genesis chapter 315 that one day uh, the seed of the woman, Jesus, would come and ultimately crush the head of Satan even though he would have a moment, he would, have a, he would be crushed but not, if not fatally not eternally. Now, what would Jesus go through in order to save us? Isaiah 53, if you have your Bible or you have your phone, look up on, the, on your phone or on the Bible, uh, look up Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 is amazing. 
This is about over 500 years before Jesus came. His mission was outlined very clearly and so that anyone could see that mission of the Messiah and what his plan was. This was the, the scripture text and many others from the Old Testament that the children of Israel never actually understood. There's two paths of the Messiah. There's one is the kingly Messiah, the glorious Messiah, the Messiah that would reign for eternity. And there's that branch of messianic prophecies. But there's also a branch of messianic prophecies that all talk about the Messiah having to suffer, having to bear our sins. That branch, the, the, their eyes were blinded Satan blinded their eyes so they didn't, they didn't when, they, when Jesus came, they didn't recognize Christ because they never, they weren't looking for a Messiah that would, would, they, who would deliver them from sin because they did not think sin was their problem. They didn't recognize, they thought that their problem was the Roman yoke and the captivity that they were under. So when Jesus came, they didn't recognize him as, because they didn't see, they saw captivity, physical captivity, more detrimental to them than they saw their captivity and their control of sin. Sin is, Roman domination wasn't, wouldn't, wouldn't give them eternal loss. But sin, if we hold on to sin, it will destroy us eternally. And so this is the, this is the prophecy in Isaiah 53 that outlines how Jesus will ultimately deliver us. And this is what it said. This is 500 years before he came on the scene, physically on the scene as a human being. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, that, that, uh, this is 500 years before. This is a prophecy telling what he would do. It says that he was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, in, in verse 3, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. And because he was made sin for us, remember? He was made sin for us, so he was smitten of God. God, uh, he was our substitute. God's judgment against sin, his hatred for sin, fell rather than upon us. It fell upon Jesus. He was smitten, in verse 4, of God and afflicted. God's wrath and hatred for sin and judgment on sin fell upon Jesus, our substitute. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, there's the same word, bruised. The same word as in Genesis. Isn't that interesting? The same exact word. He shall bruise his heel. Here's the bruising of Jesus prophesied uh, 500 years before he came to the earth. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And it says, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. How many people have gone astray here? And does anyone here say, I never went astray. I've been a perfect little boy or little girl, and I am a perfect adult. No, we all have gone astray. It says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, what? The iniquity of us all. Jesus willingly bore the iniquity of the whole human race. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. What an amazing exchange. And this is what he says that he would do. All of our sins were laid on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You remember that? When he stood before uh, their different leaders, uh, he wouldn't open their, his mouth. They slapped and they, they did everything they could to try to get him to speak and he wouldn't speak. Um, he, he, um, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And in verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. If you read the story in the New Testament, all the gospel accounts of Jesus and what happened to him, as you read the latter part of, the, of each of those gospels that tells the story of Jesus and how he, how he was treated, uh, you will read, this is exactly what happened. He was taken from prison from, uh, and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off uh, out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Uh, he, 
and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. And of course we know that ultimately the tomb he got was from a rich man, gave, him, gave up his tomb uh, so that he could be laid in there, his body would be laid there. Because he had, had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, because he never sinned. If Jesus had a sin, even in one thought or in one deed, he could not have been the savior of the human race. And it's in his perfect righteousness, he gives us, he imputes that to us, he gives it to us as a gift, and then through the power of the Holy Spirit each day working in our lives, he transforms us into his character, he makes us like himself. Isn't that amazing? We can be part of that process. That's what Jesus is doing in heaven right now. He is our high priest in heaven, ministering for us, and he sent the Holy Spirit to transform us. He says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to do what else? To cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness in our lives brings about great suffering. We have bad, our consciences are afflicted. Uh, many people turn to drugs and alcohol, uh, all different types of methods to try, to try to take care of the uneasy feeling they have because of their sins. They don't realize that Jesus has borne those sins and he wants to set them free. And that's the, that was the mission that Jesus was on. And uh, he says he made his grave. And let's see here. Uh, he, and in verse 10, uh, it, yet it pleased uh, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. He did it, Jesus did it willingly. The Father was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He did it willingly. Jesus uh, willingly did this. He shall see his seed and shall prolong his days and pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. In other words, Jesus' atonement is, was accepted by the Father. And Jesus' sacrifice was accepted and we can legally be taken into the kingdom of heaven if we accept him as our savior and receive his righteousness and allow him to transform us and bring us from rebe rebels against God's law into people that keep his law through his divine power. The Bible says in, in, Gen in Revelation chapter 14, it characterizes the people that will be saved in the last. They were, they, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the, the faith of Jesus, and have the faith of Jesus. They're in living in obedience to God's law. If you think that you can live in, obedience to, in disobedience to God's law, in rebellion against God, either in thought or in deed, and ultimately be ushered into God's kingdom, uh, then you are greatly mistaken. And if I try to kid myself to think that I can live in rebellion against God and be saved in his kingdom, then I am self-deceived. Now, who would want me to be, who would want me to think that I can live in my sins and be taken and ushered into his kingdom one day? Who would like me to believe that? Satan would love me to believe that I can live in rebellion and go to heaven. If I, living in rebellion, go into heaven, what will that make heaven? A place of misery and rebellion. God had to, it had to take the devil, had to um, banish the devil from heaven. Because he, his rebellion, after he gave time, uh, after he gave time for the devil to, Satan to, uh, to repent, and he would not repent, he had to send him out. The Bible says there's war in heaven. The devil went to war against God. And his, and his angels fought, and, and God's angels. One third of Satan, Satan was managed to deceive one third of the angels and send them ultimately to this earth. So when we're, we're dealing not with, with, the Bible says we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. We're flesh, we have a battle going on. It's called The Great Controversy. Get that book, it's on the shelves out there. Desire of Ages and Great Controversy, both amazing books. Uh, but we're, there's a battle going on for our soul. Jesus won the battle at the cross. And if we will believe in him, uh, and allow him to live in our hearts because he said it's better that I go. If I go, I will, come, I, will, uh, I will send the comforter, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come and live in you. And he, will, and he, says, he says, it's not I that live, Paul said, but not I, but Christ who lives in me to will and do his good pleasure. So if you're having a struggle with sin, it's because you don't, you're not allowing Christ to, to do the fighting. You cooperate with him, but he's the one, not I, but Christ who lives in me 
to will and do his good pleasure. As we cooperate with Jesus, well, there's no sin that we can't overcome. The Bible says that there's no temptation uh, that's not common to man, but with the temptation, God is faithful that with the temptation, he will make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. He says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. But you know what? The problem is that unless you're reading the scripture, you won't know what sin is. And you will say, well, it, that's, you know, you won't, oh, oh, I got my phone on. That's bad. I got a, got a, an, a something from Fox News. <laughs> There's the battle. There's the battle between Fox News and CNN. Fox News, CNN. There's a battle going on. And people will line up with one side or the other. Well, you know, there's an eternal battle going on for our souls. And we're going to either line up with the lies of the devil, or we're going to line up with the truth of God. And we have to make a choice. And today, we are celebrating what Jesus did on the cross to save us into his kingdom. It's an amazing, an amazing battle uh, that Jesus has won for us. And the cost was beyond words. Beyond words. There's more I could read in that one. I just want to read a little tiny bit here. Just about Jesus and the suffering. It says, Savior's burden was too heavy. And this is talking about, uh, about uh, chasing Jesus' steps, last steps to, to the sacrifice uh, for our sins. The Savior's burden was too heavy uh, for him. This is page 742, uh, Desire of Ages. Too heavy for him in his weakened weak and suffering condition. Jesus didn't use his supernatural divinity. He laid that down and only had his humanity. And, and so he was feeling completely, uh, you know, completely broken. Uh, at that point, since the Passover supper with his disciples, he had taken neither food nor drink. He had agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane in the conflict with satanic agencies. Remember that he would have died right there if the angels weren't sent to by his side and uh, to strengthen him, the Bible says. It says um, he had endured the anguish of the betrayal and had seen the disciples forsake and f and him and flee. He had been taken to, uh, to Annas, then to Caiaphas, and then to Pilate. And from Pilate he had been sent to Herod, and he was sent again to Pilate. And from insult uh, and to renewed insult, from mockery to mockery, twice tortured by the scourge. I mean, that would kill anyone. The scourge was uh, the cat of nine tails. It was these horrible uh, thing with uh, like a whip with little pieces of bone and metal on the end. And when they, 39 lashes. And and uh, they said 40 would kill a man. They got 39 lashes and it would just tear the skin off the back. I'd never seen Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, but I understand it was very graphic. And, uh, you know, it was very graphic. I mean, Jesus, what he suffered and went through for us. And that was once. He, was, he was, had that treatment twice, which I can't imagine the pain, the physical pain that that would have brought to our dear Jesus, who was totally innocent. But he was doing that to bear the sins. You're in my sins. And so it goes on to say, uh, uh, and all that night there had been scene after scene of a character to try the soul of man to the uttermost. Uh, Christ had not failed. He had spoken no word, but, the, but, uh, but, tended, uh, to, that, but that tended to glorify God. All through the disgraceful farce of a trial, he had borne himself with, with uh, firmness and dignity. But when after the second scourging, the cross was laid on him, human nature could, not, could bear no more. He fell fainting beneath the burden. The crowd that followed the Savior saw his weak and staggering steps, but they manifest no compassion. They taunted and reviled him because he could not carry the heavy cross. Again, the burden was laid on him, and again he fell fainting to the ground. His his persecutors saw that it was impossible for him to carry the burden of the, uh, any further. So they, they were puzzled to find so anyone who would bear the humiliating load. The Jews themselves could not do this because the defilement would prevent them from keeping the Passover. Can you imagine? Uh, none, even the mob that followed him, would stoop to bear the cross. At this time, a stranger called Simon of Serene, uh, Serenian, uh, uh, Sorry, Simon a Serenian, coming in from the country, meets the throng. He hears the taunts 
uh, of the crowd. He hears the words uh, uh, contemptuous, re contemptuously repeated, uh, make way for the king of the Jews. He stops in, in astonishment at the scene and, and as he expresses his compassion, they seize him and place the cross on his shoulders. And there's lots more that could be said. You can read it in, in, the, in, the, in the book. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, wind down in just a second here. I just want to read a few more words here. Uh, Jesus, uh, you know, what he went through was just beyond even anything that we could imagine. But you know, the biggest pain and the biggest agony that Jesus experienced was definitely not the pain and agony of the scourging of the horrible taunts and the cruel treatment. It wasn't the, it was nothing, had nothing, that was horrible, but it wasn't the true, uh, that that which broke his heart was not the scourgings. What was it that really put Jesus to death? The weight of sin. Judgment of, again, God's hatred for sin fell upon him. He became sin, our sin. And the judgment that should have, should fallen us because all we like sheep have gone astray each one have gone our own way on us the, the judgment should fall but Jesus says no I'm taking their place I love them too much to have this happen to them I'm going to take that and that's what broke Christ's heart and so today we're really here to celebrate an amazing gift that God would stoop to this degree to save our souls may you know the, the, the hymn that we sang uh, at the beginning, you know, just an amazing hymn, such a beautiful hymn that came out of great suffering. This, the, the folks that wrote this hymn, this Negro spiritual, asked the question, were you there? They knew about pain and suffering, and yet they saw Jesus' pain and suffering for their sins and their freedom, ultimate freedom, even in slavery, uh, they saw that freedom more important than anything else. They, they were delivered uh, from and, and they were able to sing this song in such a beautiful way, asking the question, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when they laid him to the tomb, in the tomb? Praise the Lord for a Savior that would be willing to do that for you and me. And so today we're going to celebrate this wonderful time. We, uh, and the way we do that is, well, let's just have a short prayer. Heavenly Father, there's no words that can express our deep appreciation for what you've done for us, Lord. And, you've, and the question was asked, how can I thank my Lord? Lord, the, the way that you want us to thank you is to accept your gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You, the way that we can thank you is to accept this gift and to celebrate uh, your presence and our, your uh, re uh, relationship with you, not just here for a few years, but for eternity with you. And Lord, that is the way that we can say thank you, to simply accept this amazing gift. Lord, if we don't know much about it, uh, may we get into the word and let you teach us, and, and because your Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Lord, may we hear that still small voice and follow you, because you speak to all of us, and you want all of us in your kingdom. So thank you, dear Lord. We praise you, and thank you for this time to remember. In Jesus' name, amen.